Hi, uh, this is Ann Nowak, and my um, hi, this is Ann Nowak, and my responses to the questions we were given for this week are such. Um, so, in terms of uh, why students with special needs can be bilingual, um, it this can happen very easily if a student has a hearing impairment. Um, and they learn sign language, which is a language, um, but also they need to know their um, home language or school language. So if um, that would be English, and then if that would be um, in the United States, and they would learn American Sign Language because obviously they're going to be signing in English in our country. Um, but if they were in a, another country, then they would learn um, signing that was more specific to their country or their region. Also, they um, would, uh, if they don't have a vision impairment, um, they would need to know how to communicate um, through the written. Um, word. So they are going to also learn how to read in the native language. So if that is English or Spanish or whatever. So that's how that's possible for a student with special needs um, could be bilingual. Uh, they could also um, be bilingual in that there is a native uh, language spoken at home and then um, they are ELLs but on top of that, they have a different um, disability that has placed them into special education. So in that case, they obviously would still be considered bilingual, but by no means does that mean they need to be put in special education because they're bilingual. Um, in response to the second question, um, uh, what what's the... Um, most common kind of disabilities that uh, statistically is out there for students um, that are minorities. Um, the most common is uh, learning disabled and then also um, those with speech or language impairments. Um, and most of the times that's why they're placed into special education, um, but often there are other disabilities as well, but those are the statistically the most common. And then for the third question, um, what are some effective strategies to advocate for educational social equity um, or equality for ELs? Um, so I did a Google search and from the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development website, um, they had some really, really great ideas. Um, so first of all, just know the laws for your state. Um, it's really important because that way you're informed, you understand how the law um, wants educators and those in healthcare and so on um, to equitably um, handle students and families uh, in these situations um, that have um, ELLs and what are their rights and so forth. Uh, another really great thing is just getting involved um, in groups that have to do with uh, students um, that are learning English and that are struggling and um, being, be a voice in those groups. Um, another way that they suggested that you could be an advocate is uh, by making sure that you get involved in professional development, um, be it locally, so within your district or maybe within your region or going to a national conference. And then also um, within your district, being uh, informed and in connecting with other colleagues that um, are heavily involved with teaching ELLs and forming teams so that talking to each other and getting ideas and figuring out best practices for students in your district. Um, so those were some really, really great ideas that I certainly appreciated, uh, and that's what I found out. So I'm glad we did this little assignment because it was very helpful. Thank you. Bye-bye.